recording. Okay, so uh, first thing is um, just a little bit of historical, just because this gives us an idea of the reason why I like this historical perspective. It gives us an idea of the size of viruses versus bacteria. Um, viruses are a hundred to a thousand times smaller than a bacteria. They are you know, very small to the point that we measure them in nanometers, um, whereas bacteria are often measured in micrometers. So we're talking about a thousand times less, it's a smaller unit that is used to measure uh, viruses. So the way viruses were discovered, now we knew about bacteria. This is 1892. By then we knew about bacteria. We were working with bacteria and we assume most diseases were caused by bacteria because that's, those are the ones we knew. So um, Ivanovsky and Vajeric were working on a, a plant disease uh, that affected tobacco. It was called the tobacco mosaic disease. So they, they assume it was caused by a bacteria. They took the leaves, the sick leaves of a plant and mash them up you know, with you know, water, with some fluid, and then they would filter them on filters that had pores is sm small enough to catch the bacteria. So they had these little filters in the, uh, and the water was going through these filters and the filters had tiny, tiny microscopic pores that were supposed to catch the bacteria. And the fluid that was caught from these filters is, was supposed to be bacteria free. So it could not cause disease. So we had the bacteria, according to them, they thought they were catching the bacteria in the filter. And then the fluid that they would, they would you know, get after filtering um, was supposed to be disease free. So they take the fluid. First of all, they couldn't find any bacteria. That's the first thing. And then they take the fluid and they give it to a plant thinking, okay, maybe the bacteria is so tiny that we could not catch it through the filters. They give it to a plant and the plant gets sick. So whatever was causing the disease, um, it is it's still in the fluid. That was the idea. So what they thought is whatever is going through the filters is an infectious agent that is so small, it, it is smaller than bacteria. That was the thought. Okay, so aside from bacteria, so it happens, there is something else out there and they call it an infectious agent. They even said a filterable infectious agent. So that gives you an idea of the difference in size between bacteria and viruses. Viruses are tiny, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is um, there are viruses that can infect every single little cell in this world. So viruses are specialists and they specialize in specific types of cells. So an animal virus will never infect a plant virus and a plant virus will never infect an animal virus uh, or a fungus virus will not infect an animal or a plant virus. Now there are, however, uh, there are also viruses that can infect bacteria. Viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages. So uh, because these are infecting a very simple host, Bacteriophages were typically the model for studying viruses because the bacteria are much simpler than an, an, an easy to grow than an animal cell, for example. So first thing to remember about viruses is that obviously they are too small to see under the light microscope. Um, you may be able to see them under an electron microscope with a lot of work, but you, you, know, you could be able to see them under there, under the, those uh, that type of quantification. They're measuring nanometers between 10 and 500 nanometers. Uh, the smallest ones are in the you know, 10 nanometer range. They have very few genes. The largest ones are about 500 nanometers, um, which would mean um, 0.5 micrometers. Uh, this is a bacteria versus a virus. So you can see the comparison in size. The place where bacteria and viruses meet is the largest viruses are as large as the smallest of bacteria. That's where they meet. So a large virus will be uh, uh, something like uh, the uh, smallpox virus is about 300 nanometers. Tobacco mosaic virus is about 300 nanometers. Um, 
so some of the largest viruses, 300, 500 nanometers, are as large as the smallest of bacteria. Uh, the smallest of bacteria, there's a couple of them I can give off the top of my head, the rickettsia and the chlamydia. Um, rickettsia are this one, some, one, some of the smallest bacteria out there. Uh, so these are bacteria, the smallest of bacteria. The interesting thing is that, so the book, Rickettsia, all right, uh, is the smallest bacteria. Okay, the interesting thing is that Rickettsia um, is a parasite, an intracellular parasite, just like viruses. So the idea is, the, the thought is, once you get to be this small and you have such a small genetic material, there isn't enough room to have all the genes needed to have an independent life. So you end up, um, you end up having to be a parasite, just like viruses. Okay. So uh, that gives, oh, there it is, Macroplasma rickettsia and chlamydia, those are the smallest of bacteria. All right. Um, okay, so next thing is you have to know the characteristics of a virus, and as you go through this chapter, keep those in mind. First thing, uh, the minimum that a virus has is nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, and a protein code, which is also called a casid. Those are the two components that every 100% of viruses have. Uh, tobacco mosaic virus, even though it's a fairly large virus, is actually a very simple virus. All it has is the nucleic acid and the protein code. So those are the two components, okay? Um, the uh, protein code is what protects the nucleic acid. Notice that the protein code is built on smaller subunits, which are put together and assembled to create this coat around the nucleic acid. Um, viruses have no metabolic pathways. Um, they are inert until they go inside a cell. And then they are going to use metabolic pathways in the cell to replicate, transcribe, and translate viral components. They have few enzymes. Typically, they only have the enzymes needed to hijack the host. Um, they have such few enzymes that many of them don't even have a polymerase. So they're going to borrow the DNA polymerase of the host to replicate their DNA nucleic acid. Some viruses, however, because they don't have DNA as their nucleic acid, they have RNA, they have to carry their own polymerases. Um, the fact that they have few enzymes means that there are few targets for antiviral drugs. Okay, so that is one of the problems we have when it comes to treating viruses, is that there's, there isn't much to target. Not to mention, they're not metabolically active. So whatever metabolism you target is going on inside our cells, which means that they're going to also affect our cells. They're obligate intercellular parasites. They reproduce only inside cells using the cells replication machinery. They have no ribosomes, so they're going to have to use the ribosomes of the cell. Um, they're infectious agents, and they're not considered alive. Uh, they have a simple structure. Um, all viruses have a nucleic acid core uh, with one or several pieces of linear circular of DNA or RNA, never both. And when we say never both, um, always take that with a grain of salt. We have yet to find a virus that have both. And even that is not quite true because we do know of viruses like the hepatitis B virus that has tiny pieces of RNA in the nucleic acid. So take all these with a grain of salt. What you could say is that most of the viruses that we have yet characterized either have DNA or RNA. They don't have both, at least not in significant amounts. Um, notice that the shape of the nucleic acid can be linear or circular. So you know it's very versatile. It doesn't have to be double-stranded. It can be single-stranded. It can be a combination of single-stranded and double-stranded. It can be a combination of circular and linear. So extremely versatile. Essentially, there are no rules as to how the nucleic acid must be presented. Um, they do have a protein code that covers the nucleic acid to protect it. Uh, keep in mind, nucleic acid is 
a molecule that is easily digested by nucleases, by enzymes. So most cells, most living cells, will have nucleases to digest nucleic acids. So especially bacterial cells, and we know that restriction enzymes. So nucleic acid is prone to attack. Um, and that's why the protein code will protect it. Um, many viruses will have, in addition to the protein code, a phospholipid envelope that comes from the cell membrane of the host cell. So remember, cell membranes are made of phospholipids. So this lipid envelope that it's called is actually the cell membrane of the last host. Um, many viruses have protein spikes that protrude from that envelope. So here's a, uh, depictions of what is called a naked virus without a, 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 a um, envelope and an, an envelope virus with an envelope. Uh, so all viruses are going to have the nucleic acid core, DNA or RNA, the protein code made of sub protein subunits called capsomeres, and then the two of them could bind are called the nucleocapsid. So for the next test, you should be able to identify the components of a virus. You should be able to identify the nucleic acid, the protein, the both of them together are called the nucleocapsid. You should know that the protein subunits are called capsomeres. Um, envelope viruses are going to have the envelope, nucleic acid inside a protein code, the envelope surrounding the protein code. Uh, protein caps, uh, code is still made of subunits called castomeres, and spike proteins protruding from the code, the envelope, I should say, the protein envelope. Viruses with an envelopes are called naked. Um, not envelope viruses or naked viruses are more resistant to disinfectants. We saw that in chapter five, that the easiest thing to kill was an envelope virus. So non-envelope viruses, naked viruses, are harder to kill, which tells you that the, the protein is extremely stable because, in general, proteins are very susceptible to their environment. So the fact that these proteins aren't make them very, very stable proteins. Um, so here's a animal virus. Uh, it has the code, the protein code, um, or capsid. It has the spikes protruding from the protein code. Uh, this is tobacco mosaic virus. You notice that this one doesn't have spikes. It just has the protein and the nucleic acid. Both are naked viruses. On the other hand, this one is an envelope virus, and you can see the envelope surrounding the, uh, the uh, protein uh, uh, acid. Again, the envelope is coming from the host cell. So it's not a viral origin, which means it is not coded in the nucleic acid of the virus, the gene to make a phospholipid membrane. Um, there are the spikes coming out of the uh, envelope. These protein spikes are usually viral, and they're usually glycoproteins. So when you see in a depiction of a virus, you see the name of the spike as being called GP, for example, GP120. One of the spikes in the HIV virus. You know that GP stands for glycoprotein. Okay, so this is a micrograph picture of an envelope virus over here on the left. This is a representation of an envelope virus. Uh, viruses are found in two states. Uh, virion is the extracellular virus. Um, the entire viral particle outside the host cell. Uh, intracellular is the actual virus. So even though there is, technically speaking, different terms to identify the extracellular virus versus the intracellular virus, notice that we use the term virus indiscriminately. So really, uh, we should be a bit more careful, but in reality, we use virus indiscriminately to identify the, the uh, um, infectious agent outside or inside the cell. Technically speaking, however, the virion is just outside the cell. OK, so you should definitely know the characteristics of viruses and the, um, the um, uh, structure of viruses. All right, so what affects the replication strategy of a virus is the genome. 
because the virus has to copy its genome. That's what's going to dictate um, what our virus is going to infect and where they're going to go. So everything revolves around the genome. How is it replicated? How is it transcribed? How is it translated? Um, so we have DNA viruses and RNA viruses. Uh, the viral genome may be linear or circular um, or a combination of both. And obviously the viral genome is much smaller than the genome of a cell. Um, let's see. Yeah, it can be double-stranded, single-stranded, linear or circular. Uh, recognition sites are the structures used by a virion, the viral particle outside the cell, to attach or recognize the specific receptor on the host cell. So recognition sites will be the protein, the viral proteins used by the virus to attach to the, to the receptors in the host cell. These recognition sites can be found in tail fibers in bacteriophages, in the spikes of naked virus, in specific sites of naked virus in the capsid, or again, in spikes of envelope viruses. So recognition sites could be part of the capsomere, for example, of the virus. Um, it could be part of the spikes protruding from the virus. Or in the case of bacteriophages, these leg-looking things from the bacteriophage are called tail fibers, and that's where the recognition sites could be found. Um, recognition sites is what gives host specificity. In other words, these molecules are specifically binding to host proteins. So if the host doesn't have the proteins, the virus cannot infect that cell. So that's what limits the kinds of cells that can be infected. A protein code or capsid surrounds nucleic acid core, provides protection and recognition size. We talked about that. Um, the uh, protein code or capsid can have different shapes. Um, it can have triangular shapes, in which case we call them icosahedral shape. Um, helical is a rod-like shape. Complex, it depends on what kind of virus we're looking at. It could be many different layers of these proteins, or it could be the spaceship shape of a bacteriophage. All of these are made of proteins, uh, subunit proteins called capsomeres. So this is a helical virus, uh, which has a spiral kind of fashion. An icosahedral virus will be this one right here, which is actually a series of 20 uh, triangles put together. This is a complex virus. A bacteriophage is a complex virus. So an animal virus or a plant virus is typically complex because it has many layers. Okay, just, just Sorry, guys, I had really had to answer that one. Okay, all right, let's see. Let's go on. Okay, so what do we have? Okay, classification of viruses. Um, first level of classification is whether there is the host. 
So we have animal viruses, plant viruses, we have bacteriophages. So that's the first level of classification. Uh, again, they are specialists, they don't cross over. Second criteria for classification is the nucleic acid. So we have DNA viruses, RNA viruses. So we have animal DNA viruses, animal RNA viruses, plant DNA viruses, plant RNA viruses, uh, bacteriophages, DNA viruses, bacteriophages, RNA viruses. And then we have other levels like the strandness of the, uh, of the, of the nucleic acid, double-stranded, single-stranded, uh, the shape or the disease or the symptoms that the organism causes, that the, uh, the, the virus causes. So the classification, even though it's, we try to make it the same as, as cells, sometimes it's not as clear as that of cells. Um, we do classify viruses into families and the families typically have the, suff the suffix viridia on their names. So coronaviridia is a family of viruses and the term corona, which means crown, indicates the appearance of the virus. Um, Virinia viridia indicates the geographical location where the virus was located. Picorna viridia indicates the size of the virus. Oftentimes in the name of the family, it is hidden the nucleic acid. It is the, the, uh, what the, uh, the type of nucleic acid that family of viruses has. So if you notice in the Picorna viridia, they have hidden the RNA right there of the virus. So these are little viruses that are RNA viruses. So uh, oftentimes if you are, you know, if you look at it, you'll see that. Um, if it ends in the word virus, that's talking about the genera. So now we're talking about a very low level of classification. Remember, genus and species is the lowest level, so much lower than family. So now we have enteroviruses, uh, which infect the GI tract, and um, it has the virus name in it, so that's the, um, the uh, genus. Uh, a species is often the, the viral disease. Polioviruses causes poliomyelitis. Uh, viruses often refer to the disease name. So oftentimes we say the poliovirus in the say, in, uh, uh, instead of the, uh, you know, the uh, more official name. Now, there is an informal classification of viruses that is especially used in the medical world. And then they are classified based on the route of transmission, which is a much simpler, not taxonomically correct way to classify viruses. So based on the form of transmission, we can classify viruses as enteric if they are transmitted via the fecal oral route, respiratory if they're transmitted via the respiratory uh, droplets, zoonotic if they're uh, transmitted via animals, and sexually transmitted viruses. So you should know this classification, uh, you should know what the classification means and examples of viruses within that classification. So the enteric viruses are the ones that are transmitted via the fecal oral route. So they're transmitted essentially via food or drink. Uh, so they go through the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, they often cause gastroenteritis, but not always. We shouldn't assume that just because they are infected, they, they go into the body via the, gas, the um, GI tract, that they're gonna cause GI tract problems. For example, the polio virus is transmitted via the fecal oral route but it causes a systemic, especially nervous system type of infection. Uh, rotavirus is, on the other hand, just a gastrointestinal virus. Uh, a respiratory virus. Uh, the uh, respiratory tract is the number one portal of entry of viruses. So these are the viruses that are usually inhaled in droplets, um, generally remain within the, the respiratory tract. Not always, but generally. So adenovirus is an example of a virus that um, goes into the respiratory tract. A zoonotic virus is one that is catch, caught from animals, uh, other animals, uh, typically uh, arthropods. Arthropods are animals that have an exoskeleton, meaning they have um, a hard shell. So that can be an insect or it can be a, a, a spider or it can be a tick. All those are arthropods. Spiders and ticks are not insects. Um, so uh, examples of these kinds of, vi of viruses are the rabies virus, the Zika virus. Um, the zoonotic viruses that are transmitted via arthropods are called arboviruses. Arboviruses are called 
are, are means arthropod borne virus. Uh, an arthropod virus will be the Zika virus, the West Nile virus. The rabies virus is not an arthropod because it's transmitted via mammals. Um, on the other hand, the uh, did I mention rabies? The rabies virus is definitely an arthropod Okay. I'm oh, sorry, not the rabies. I was thinking uh, uh, yellow fever. Yellow fever virus is definitely a, 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 an arthropod virus. Uh, sexually transmitted viruses are transmitted via sexual contact and they, cause, they may cause lesions in the genitalia or they may cause other kinds of infections. Herpes virus, papillomavirus do cause lesions in the genitalia. On the other hand, the HIV virus is a sexually transmitted virus that causes an immune system yeah, uh, disease, infection. Um, so the viral recognition sites that we mentioned are usually glycoproteins, and they're going to be complementary to proteins in the host cell called host receptors. Uh, for example, the HIV virus uh, has a recognition site, which is a spike. It's called the PG120 spike, which can recognize a protein called the CD4 protein, which is found in T helper lymphocytes, in a special type of lymphocytes. So those are the only cells the HIV virus can attach to via these CD4 uh, receptor, which means those are the only cells that are infected. Uh, however, these cells are so important to the immune system that when these cells are infected, the entire immune system is compromised. Um, very few viruses are generalists or can infect more than one type of host. One example of a generalist virus is the rabies virus that can infect many different types of mammals. Uh, notice, however, that the hosts are always animals and they're mammals, so they're not a lizard, for example, they're not reptiles. Okay. So we're going, to we're going to look at how bacteriophages infect and how they work. And based on that, we can extrapolate how animal viruses may also infect and work. Because the, the first investigations happened around bacteriophages, that was our first initiation on how, on how viruses acted. So, um, OK. So uh, let's see, phage, phage. OK. So we know that a bacteriophage, or also called just a phage, is a virus that infects bacteria. And we've characterized three types of infections that a bacteriophage can cause in a bacterial cell. A lytic infection, temperate virus, which causes a lysogenic infection, and a filamentous virus. Um, we are only going to talk about the lytic and the temperate viruses. We're not going to talk about the filamentous viruses. So a lytic or virulent phage uh, causes a very, ex a, a type of infection you would expect a virus to cause. Uh, this is called lytic replication. This is what we call a productive infection because it's gonna produce viral particles. An example of a lytic phage is T4, which is a double-stranded DNA virus, and the cell, the bacteria that it infects is E. coli. This the cycle burst time is how long it takes for the virus to infect the cell and, and for the cell to begin making viral particles. That takes about 30 minutes. So the steps of lytic replication will be attachment of the virus to the surface of the host cell, in this case bacteria, E. coli, the entry of the genome, the nucleic acid, into the host cell, the synthesis, um, and synthesis involves many things. It involves uh, replication of the nucleic acid. In this case, it's a DNA virus, so replication of, a, of the DNA of the virus. Uh, it also involves transcription and translation. So all this goes under synthesis. And then we have the assembly of the viral particles that have been made through transcription and, and uh, translation, and then the release of the virus. 
obviously um, more than one viral particle will be released. Hundreds, if not thousands of viral particles is, are typically released. Okay, so synthesis involved all of these processes. So attachment to the virus to the receptor of the host, this is the bacteria. Um, so they find they attach to receptors found on the cell wall. This is a bacteria, cell wall, sometimes flagella, sometimes fimbria. And this is from the, the actual lecture book. Uh, the virus contacts the, uh, the uh, host cell by random collision, random Brownian movement. Um, so it's not a purposeful attachment. It's just completely random. The virus happens to attach to the host cell. Um, it may depend on chemical attractions and precise fit between the viral uh, receptor sites and the host uh, receptor. And then comes the genome entry into the host. Uh, most viruses have some form of lysozymes that are going to allow it to, to um, um, it's going to allow it to go into the um, into the host, uh, damage the, the uh, cell membrane and go into the host. Now, one thing to note is that in the case of bacteriophages, the only thing that enters the host cell is going to be the genome. That's going to be different in animal viruses. So what's left behind is an empty virus that is going to be you know, destroyed. Just there are always enzymes in the environment that would probably destroy that viral capsid the empty shell. Then comes synthesis of proteins and genome. Um, so remember, replication, transcription, and translation is what we mean by these syntheses. The first proteins that are going to be transcribed and translated, which are transcribed and translated within minutes of entry of the viral nucleic acid into the host, are going to be the proteins that allows the virus to take over the host. For example, nucleases, which are going to degrade the host DNA into individual you know, nucleotides, adenines, guanine, cytosines, which the virus is going to use to assemble its own nucleic acid. Um, viral proteins needed to modify the host RNA polymerase to recognize the viral promoter. That's another, um, another uh, uh, early protein. Uh, late proteins are the ones that help the virus assemble the new viral particles and um, and eventually release itself, the new viral particles into the environment. Um, the uh, cell genome is gone. The uh, cell, ha the virus has made the, the cell replicate the viral DNA, in this case, because we're talking about DNA virus, otherwise it would be RNA, um, and the viral proteins have been made. Notice that this is all made first and then comes the actual um, assembly. So again, during late transcription, the assembly, the putting together all of the viral components takes place. So uh, these sometimes do need, does need some help from um, viral enzymes. Other times, this is just self-assembled. Uh, finally, the release of the uh, viral particles is done via uh, lysozymes that are produced late in the synthesis. And the phages release, the number of phages release is what we call the burst size. And in the case of the T4, about 200 phages are released every 30 minutes. The burst time was 30 minutes, burst size is 200 phages. So every 30 minutes, 200 phages are released, ready to infect adjacent E. coli if they're there to be found. OK, so that's the lytic infection. It's a productive infection because at the end, we end up with new viral particles. Um, the lytic infections uh, or lysogenic infections um, are carried out by what we call temperate phages. For example, the lambda phage is a double standard DNA phage whose host is E. coli again. And that's the first lytic phage that, that was studied. So lytic phage, temperate phage, same thing. Um, the, the type of replication that goes on 
or infection, I should say, is um, called a lysogenic replication or lysogenic infection. So this is what happens. Uh, the first steps are the same. The virus attaches to the host. The virus uh, injects its nucleic acid into the host. But now, instead of going into the lytic cycle, the nucleic acid of the virus is going to insert itself into the nucleic acid of the host E. coli cell, in this case is E. coli, and remains there indefinitely as a prophage. Every time the cell divides, the um, prophage is also replicated. So every 20 minutes when the E. coli multiplies, as it copies its DNA, it's also going to copy the prophage. And every single daughter cell will have a prophage. So this is a way to replicate the viral nucleic acid without having to make viral particles. Now, if the, the, um, the cell goes into some form of um, stress in which it is signaled that it may die, that is going to cause the prophage to excise away from the host chromosome and enter a lytic infection. So the phage has become attached to the part of the host chromosome via a viral enzyme called an integrase. Um, the phage joins the uh, chromosomal DNA, the chromosome of the, of the host, via what's called site-specific recombination. So it does not join at a random site, it joins at a specific site in the DNA of the host. So, okay. And um, at a time that is sensed that the bacteria is under environmental stress, meaning uh, high temperature, low water, low nutrients, radiation, the prophage excises out of the host genome and it enters the lytic infection. Okay, so we talked about the prophage replicating within the host chromosome. Prophage can excise but phage encoded enzymes resulting in a lytic infection. So the phage remains in a lysogenic infection indefinitely, uh, replicating every time the uh, virus, the, sorry, the bacteria replicates. But if something induces, if there's induction, the phage to pull out, it will enter the lytic cycle. So now you have going into the lytic cycle which eventually will cause the release of viral particles. But that is a lytic cycle, not a lysogenic cycle. Okay. Uh, one of the things that could induce excision is UV damage. So in the laboratory, we could uh, trigger excision of the prophage by exposing the culture of E. coli cells through UV light. Now, um, lysogeny has its own characteristics. First of all, every bacteria who has been, uh, who's carrying a lysogen, a prophage, is immune to infection by the same type of virus. The reason why is because the, the phage DNA enters the host DNA and introduces itself on a specific spot. Once that spot is occupied, there is no room for a second virus. So the prophage is going to put out um, repressors that will prevent other viruses from going in. The other um, characteristic of lysogenic infections is that oftentimes <coughs> the prophage is carrying with it genes from the previous host that are now going to be part of the new host. This is called lysogenic convention, uh, conversion. So oftentimes the prophage, it, as it inserts itself into the genome of the new host, will change the phenotype and make that host 
the recipient of genes that it didn't have before. And the ones that we care about are genes that code for toxins that make the bacteria all of a sudden more pathogenic or even pathogenic. So here's examples of toxins that bacteria acquire via prophages. Uh, Cordinobacterium diphtheria, which is the bacteria that causes diphtheria, only can cause diphtheria if the bacteria has received the gene for diphtheria toxin, which is carried by a virus. Uh, same thing for Clostridium botulinum, for E. coli O157787, Streptococcus pyogenes, if it can cause a scarlet fever only if it has received the toxin gene for scarlet fever via a virus. So viruses can make bacteria more pathogenic to the point that some of the bacteria that we consider pathogenic are only pathogenic because they have been infected by a specific virus that is carrying that toxin, the gene for the toxins. So how does a virus carry the gene for a bacterial toxin? Um, remember for chapter eight, we talked about generalized transduction which was the process by which a bacteriophage could pick up a random piece of DNA, of host DNA, and deliver it to a different cell. And it's called generalized because any of the DNA uh, genes of the host could be picked up and it could be transferred. Specialized transduction, on the other hand, is more specific. Because remember, when a lysogenic phage infects a bacteria, it's going to insert itself into a specific place, which means that any gene that is flanking the prophage, any bacterial gene flanking the, the uh, prophage on either side, are specific genes. So maybe one of those pieces is a gene that codes for a toxin. So an induction happens, and the prophage pulls out from the host DNA. And in doing so, it mistakenly carries with it one of the adjacent genes. So you can see here the little prophage has acquired one of the genes that was flanking next to the uh, prophage. Now, these viral particle, viral DNA, carrying the host gene will be replicated. And every single one of the, and, you know, because the, the virus enters the lytic cycle, every single one of the viral particles produced will have that novel that gene from the host DNA. So there are two differences between generalized and specialized transduction. In generalized transduction, a random piece of DNA is given from the host bacteria, is given to one viral particle. So out of the 200 viral particles that are produced by the less, uh, lytic cycle, only one of those viral particles carries the, ho the uh, host bacteria gene. On the other hand, generalized transduction, every single vir viral pr virus produced will carry the gene of the host. That's one difference. The other is that the gene of the host is a very specific gene. The only genes that are lysogenized and passed on are the ones that are adjacent to where the prophage inserted itself in the host. OK. Um, so now we have out here showing you specialized transduction. And each one of the viral particles you can see here carries the host gene. So you should know what we mean by uh, lysogenic conversion, specialized transduction, lysogenic immunity. OK, so now we can look at animal viruses and compare and contrast the way that viruses um, uh, Animal versus prophage, uh, bacterial virus, animal viruses versus bacteriophages infect their host. So, in the case of animal viruses, there is attachment. Um, the viral recognition sites will be in the cell membrane because animal cells don't have a cell wall 
they typically don't have flagella either. Um, the entry is one of the greatest differences. In the case of animal viruses, the entire virus is going to enter, not just the nucleic acid. So the entire particle will be phagocytized by the cell and enter in the cell. So the virus enters by endocytosis. The uh, viral spikes have attached to the, um, to the cell membrane of the host. So here's entry. Uh, notice this is looking at two ways in which, oh, let me go back here. This is showing you how a naked virus will enter. And essentially the spikes from the uh, uh, protein code will bind to the receptor in the cell and then the host cell will be triggered, phagocytized, to bring in the, um, the viral particle, the entire viral particle. Um, if the virus has to have, happens to have an envelope, there are two strategies for entry. Both are similar, however. In one of them, the virus goes in, the protein code goes in, but notice that the envelope stays behind as part of the cell membrane and is left behind is still with the spikes attached. But the only thing that enters is the protein code. Um, the next step is what we call uncoding, in which the code is removed and the nucleic acid is set free. On the other hand, the um, another another version, another way in which an envelope virus could, could entry could enter is that the entire Thing, the entire virus is phagocytized. And then within the phagocytic vesicle, the uh, phagocytic vesicle releases the protein code, retains the envelope with the spikes, and the envelope with the spikes goes back and becomes part of the cell membrane while the protein code is inside the cytoplasm and uncoding removes the nucleic acid from the code. So membrane fusion versus endocytosis is, are the two strategies for an envelope virus. Oncoding, or the removal of protein codes, or happens on every single case. Whether the virus is uh, naked or an envelope virus, here you have the oncoding. So in the case of this virus, the virus traveled, is brought in by endocytosis. Uh, it is released from the uh, vesicle and then travels uh, to the nucleus where it, uh, it inserts the DNA into a nuclear core. So you should be familiar with these strategies. Uh, the next step is the synthesis of, again, which means transcription and translation of the viral nucleic acid and replication of the viral nucleic acid. Um, most DNA viruses will multiply in the nucleus because that's where the DNA polymerase will be found. And the um, uh, the uh, DNA enters via a nuclear pore. So DNA viruses must travel to the nucleus where the host DNA polymerase is found. Uh, host DNA polymerase will be modified to replicate viral genomes. Um, RNA viruses stay in the cytoplasm and have their own polymerases. Uh, they have no need to go to the nucleus because the DNA polymerase is not going to replicate an RNA virus. A retrovirus could go either way. Most of them are going to, um, they care, well, all of them carry their own polymerase and they may travel to the nucleus, even though nowadays we do know that some of them stay in the cytoplasm and they use their DNA polymerase to, which I will talk about in just a second, to uh, their polymerase, I should say, their polymerase to replicate its nucleic acid. And then if the nucleic acid being replicated into a DNA form enters the nucleus. So um, I know the PowerPoint says that they travel to the nucleus and we're going to stick to that. However, keep in mind that is not entirely correct every time anymore. Okay, so let's go for um, viral DNA goes to the nucleus of host where they will use cells DNA polymerase to copy the viral genome 
and RNA polymerase to transcribe our genes. Okay, so a DNA virus has it made. It doesn't have to carry any polymerases. All of it can be found in the nucleus of the cell. Um, on the other hand, an RNA virus is a different story because, again, the virus has to replicate its genome. There are no polymerases in, the, in a cell that can do that. What we have in a cell is two types of polymerases. In a cell, we have DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase, which is in the nucleus of a cell, of an animal cell, so that's a DNA poly. What it does is it can copy DNA. So it takes double-stranded DNA and the enzyme will copy the double-stranded DNA into an identical double-stranded DNA molecule. Okay, so it's DNA to DNA. RNA polymerase, which the cell uses for transcription, what it does is it makes a single-stranded RNA copy of one of the strands of a DNA. So what it does is it takes the double-stranded DNA of the host, this is happening in all our cells, and RNA polymerase transcribes it into a single-stranded messenger RNA. Okay? This is the, the virus, an RNA virus cannot use, has no need for any of these. Well, I will argue that the RNA polymerase, but okay. Because what an RNA virus needs is a polymerase that can, that can copy an RNA molecule from RNA to RNA. That's what the virus needs. So it needs a polymerase that can take RNA and copy it and make an RNA copy of the RNA. That's what an RNA virus needs. So it must carry its own polymerase because none of the polymerases of the host can do that job. The, the viral RNA polymerase is either called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase or much shorter replicates. So this is a polymerase, an RNA polymerase that can make an RNA copy of an RNA. Okay, so. Uh, the problem with it is that RNA polymerases are not very good at check. Actually, they're not very good. They cannot check for mistakes. They have no proofreading ability because they are RNA polymerase. They're not a DNA polymerase, which means they have a high rate of mutations. RNA viruses constantly change. Case in point, the influenza virus. The rhinovirus that causes the common cold constantly changes. Coronavirus changes very often also, as we have, we're finding out, is because it's an RNA virus that has to use an RNA polymerase that has no proofreading ability. So makes a mistake, doesn't even know about it. And again, all this is happening in the cytoplasm of the host. Um, Okay, so there is the virus entering by endocytosis. There is the RNA of the virus, the um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, also called replicase, is going to make copies of the RNA. And then the ribosomes of the host are going to translate those copies into uh, viral um, proteins, which are going to be assembled into a new virus. Have influenza virus is an RNA virus that experiences lots of mutations, what are called antigenic drifts, due to spontaneous mutations. So those are the mutations due to um, mistakes in the RNA polymerase, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It also experiences antigenic shifts due to genetic reassortment. Okay, so what genetic reassortment means is two different viruses going into the same cell, 
And because the infection is happening at the same time, when the viral particles are assembled, some of the viral particles will end up with the DNA, or sorry, RNA, from the other type of virus. So we end up with genetic reassortment between viruses. An example of these among the influenza virus is the way in which we get the what we call the bird influenza. Because what happens is a bird influenza virus cannot infect a human cell. A human influenza virus cannot infect a bird cell. However, both bird influenza and human influenza can infect a pig cell. So pigs are called the mixing vessels for influenza viruses. And because they can be infected by different types of influenza viruses, genetic reassortment happens, and they are the ones who are putting out these novel influenza viruses. Okay. That happens you know, every year, sometimes being more you know, bad than others. All right, retroviruses are reverse transcribing viruses. They are RNA viruses, but instead of carrying um, replicases, they carry a different kind of polymerase called reverse transcriptase. Uh, the virus travels to the nucleus, and again, we qualify that. Now we know some of them don't, but regardless, they, tra they have the reverse transcriptase. And what reverse transcriptase is going to do, something very novel, is they're going to take the RNA of the virus and it's going to make DNA copies of that RNA. So it's turning the um, RNA genome of the virus into a DNA genome. And that's what reverse transcriptase can do. So um, what that does is that now we have a DNA version of the viral genome, which can be inserted into the host chromosome. And that's what these viruses do. They insert themselves into the genome of the host once the DNA version of their genome is created, and they just work from the nucleus of the cell in that manner. They may remain there latent, or they may begin to make the cell transcribe and translate their DNA. Um, examples of retroviruses, the HIV virus is a retrovirus. The HTLV virus is a retrovirus also. HTLV stands for uh, human T cell leukemia virus. So this is a virus that causes leukemia. And you know, the H HIV causes AIDS. Um, assembly of the virus happens uh, if the virus has not become latent and remain inside the, uh, the genome of the cell, like sometimes DNA viruses do or reverse transcriptase viruses do. And then the new viral particles are released. Um, the naked viruses are released when the host cell dies by apoptosis, which means cell death. Um, envelope viruses are typically, is typically done through what's called botting, uh, which means the viral particles are, the, the viral protein is assembled. The spikes of the virus are assembled into the cell membrane of the host, and then the protein pushes against the membrane and it buds out as an envelope virus, as you can see here in the picture on the right. Uh, Botting out has the advantage that the host cell is kept alive for a lengthy period of time as this process keeps going on slowly, uh, producing viral particles over a long period of time. Okay, so that is in a gist the way animal viruses are going to work. Um, do be able, you should be able to compare and contrast you know, what parts of the the uh, uh, animal virus infection doesn't happen in the bacteriophage, uncoding, for example, uh, because the animal virus, the entire virus goes inside. In the case of animal viruses, you have two different locations where the virus can, can, uh, can synthesize, can go to, cytoplasm or nuclear. 
um, you should know what reverse transcriptase is, uh, what are replicases, uh, RNA dependent, RNA polymerases. Okay. Um, give me just a second. I'm going to go a little bit further, not much more, just because it's getting late and I have a class, that's my problem, that I need to go to, so uh, on campus class. So anyway, so let me just go take five more minutes and then I'll, I'll stop. So we're not going to finish, but we're almost going to be there. Um, okay, so um, yeah, in the body produces antiviral proteins like interference and antibodies. Antiviral drugs are generally poor selective toxicity because whatever damages the virus is going to damage the host since the virus is using the host's mechanisms. Uh, viral infections can be of two types, acute or persistent. Acute infections are the ones that have a rapid onset, short duration, productive infections, viral particles are produced, and typically result in long-lasting immunity. Um, in the case of naked viruses, they will lyse the host, the host cell. In the case of envelope viruses, budding will probably take place. Um, an example of a, of a uh, acute infection is the one produced by the hepatitis A virus. On the other hand, a persistent infection will continue on for many years. Uh, sometimes it may, it may continue on for a lifetime, may or may not have symptoms, uh, persistent infections can be chronic or latent. Okay, chronic means that the virus is active the whole time, and it um, viral particles can be detected at every time, every, all of the years of the infection, um, and the damage is done very, very slowly, uh, and it accumulates and eventually results in the death of the patient. Examples of chronic viruses, the hepatitis B virus and the hepatitis C virus. This is the caveat, however. Hepatitis B virus, most of the time is acute, 80% of the time. Only 20% of the time turns into a chronic virus, depending on the age of the patient, the immune system of the patient, which means that it's mostly acute, but because it can be chronic, we look at it as a chronic virus. On the other hand, hepatitis C most of the time is chronic, 80%, only a little bit of the time can be acute. And obviously that's also rightfully so called an acute, uh, a chronic virus. So when you have a hepatitis B infection, after you're infected and the virus sets in, at any point in time over all of the years that the infection proceeds, we should be able to see in the blood, detect viral particles. Uh, contrast that with a latent infection. In a latent infection, the virus will remain in the chromosome in the nucleic acid of the host hidden over an indefinite period of time. And it only comes out once in a while and reactivates an infection. The integrated virus is called a provirus, and this is similar to the prophage in the lysogenic infections of bacteria. So in those cases, the only time you can detect the virus is when it becomes active. So a perfect example of a latent virus is the chickenpox virus, chickenpox zoster virus, which is a herpes virus number three. When you have chickenpox, you, know, you get the, the disease, the virus goes away, it appears to be an acute infection. However, in many instances, the virus has gone to, leave, to live inside some of the neurons in our body um, and remains hidden inside the nucleus of these neurons and our entire lifetimes can go by and never comes back. But let's say 50 years later, uh, because our immune system may be compromised or because we're under stress, the virus is activated again and it causes an infection. Typically, the infection will be different from the first infection. In this case, the infection is herpes, herpes zoster. And that, again, is one time, another time when we can detect the viral particles in the blood of the patient. Uh, in between, viral particles cannot be detected. We may detect antibodies, but not viral particles. Okay, so that is where I'm going to stop. There's a little bit more left, but um, I will either make the recording going over the last part of these, or uh, uh, just find a recording from the from previous classes and put it in. 
Either way, I will go ahead and make sure there's a recording for the last part of it. Okay, I'm going to have to go ahead and sign off.